Welcome to Consumer Goods Technology. I'm Lisa Johnson, the Managing Editor of CGT, and I'm here today talking with Jen Shaw of Elder Research about where consumer goods companies are putting artificial intelligence and machine learning to work. So Jen, welcome. Uh, can you get us started by telling us a little bit about yourself and a little bit about Elder Research? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so I work for a company called Elder Research and we are a full service data analytics solution provider with over 25 years of expertise in data science, data engineering, um, and data strategy. We enable organizations to successfully extract value from their data um, and other resources by handcrafting innovative analytic solutions that inform decisions, deliver value, and transform organizations. Um, I'm myself in charge of the, our North America commercial efforts, and I like to see myself as a barricade buster, someone who can uh, work through solutions and, and remove impediments to uh, deploying data analytics and getting that value from organizations. Great. Well, I love the description of barricade buster. Um, okay, so let's start off the conversation with some background on the topic. So within the consumer goods industry, what are some of the primary areas of business right now that are really right for uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning ROI? Yeah, machine learning and, and artificial intelligence can be very helpful in a lot of the different business units or functional units in a consumer good organization. But what we've really found that makes the biggest difference is having a good solid uh, data strategy um, and data platform that people in the organization can access. So once you have your enterprise data solution in place or at least planned for, then other functional units like operations or marketing or sales or research and development um, have a lot of prime targets to uh, get value from analytics. Um, so for operations, you know, there's obviously the predictive maintenance and, you know, changeover optimizations in the machinery to keep your machines running as much as possible. Uh, safety stock optimization, uh, inventory and fines. Um, you know, there's a lot of recording and, and optimization that can be done in those areas. Um, marketing, obviously, there's customer lifetime value or consumer lifetime value. Um, and even things like programmatic ads and paid search, where a lot of organizations pay a third party vendor to do these things for them. Um, it's really good practice to look at that data yourself and analyze whether, you know, these organizations are doing a really good job for you and, and providing value for what, you know, they pay for. Um, sales, you know, their share of shelf, planogram optimization. Um, one big thing that we've been doing for a lot of organizations lately is a trade allowance allocation. Um, and I, I can go into that a little bit more later. Um, and then R&D, uh, you know, there's R&D is pretty much integrated into all these other business units, um, but there's also analytics that can be done within R&D, such as, you know, packaging testing, um, ratings and reviews, um, you know, components of, uh, you know, a shampoo that you're making, we can price out different components of the shampoo. So when prices raise and fall on the different ingredients, um, you can manage the formula in a less expensive way that, that still retains the same result for the same end result for the consumer. I know you just gave us a lot of different use cases. And I know uh, that Elder Research with, works with a, a range of clients in the space. So let's get into the weeds a little bit with some examples. Um, can you tell us some of the you know experiences your clients have had when implementing AI and ML, you know what's gone well, what hasn't, uh, challenges and roadblocks. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one of the ones that I just referred to was a trade allowance allocation. So this is where a lot of organizations um, have arrangements with the retailers to help provide them funding for either good performance of sales or help make those sales happen or, you know, everyday low pricing, you know, those sort of things. So, and this can be a large part of a consumer good company's budget. So um, we've seen up to 20% of it. So if you're a $5 billion company, um, then maybe $1 million of that is earmarked for these trade allowance allocations. When you look at the variety of brands that consumer good organizations typically have and the number of retailers they sell their brands into, that can be thousands of combinations of, you know, shampoo one at, you know, Target and, you know, kitty litter three at Walmart. Um, and so we've seen that organizations really manually try to optimize that based on a sales growth target. Um, we've seen it take weeks of teams of people's times to really try to figure out what the best breakdown of delivering that money in those, those different possible brands. Um, but a 
relatively straightforward optimization takes care of that problem pretty quickly. Um, you know, I think in some of the most of the situations we find that it saves, you know, a couple thousand hours of, of man hours, person hours a year, um, and a five year MPV of about $2 million is the average that we're finding. Um, some of the downfalls we see from that is person management, right? So people that have been doing these exercises for years tend to have a hard time accepting analytics sometimes. Um, so really working with the people, working with the change management, you know, finding out their thought process and really developing a solution around how they do things can be really effective in having a solution work in the end. Okay, so let's build on that a little bit. Um, so we talked about the, the primary use cases for AI and, and ROI. Um, but what about these risks and threats? What are the greatest threats to AI and ML initiatives in CPG? Yeah, actually, um, you know, so kind of building on the previous conversation, a lot of it's people. Um, you know, math is the relatively easy part. It, it can be challenging, um, you know, but if you have good data analysts and data scientists and they know how to perform that math, it's the people behind it that tend to be um, the problem in implement, implementing solutions. Um, a lot of that is, is buy-in. Like I said, you know, people have been doing things a certain way for years. You know, they don't trust that an analytic solution can do the job, you know, as well or even better sometimes. And there's also a lot of fear. Um, so when we first start working with an organization, sometimes people are resistant to help or resistant to communicate because they feel like the analytics will take over their position. Um, and what we found is really that you know, an analytics solution will have really good accuracy and say forecasting, um, and a person will as well. But combining them together, like using a person in a machine generated forecast really delivers the best results. And when we give computers the job of, you know, repetitive tasks and math, then that also frees the person up to be, you know, more creative and develop more solutions um, because they have more time. We're not replacing people, we're just giving people more time to do the work they need to do. Yeah, well, somewhat relatedly, I know I'm personally waiting for AI to get more widespread use in copy editing when we're talking about repetitive tasks. So <laughs> <laughs> I say that now, we'll see, you know, of course. But um, okay, so then let's let's build on that. How can companies de-risk themselves from these threats? You know, do you have any, our audience loves practical recommendations. So are you, do you have any you can share? Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the biggest things um, is to get executive buy-in, um, you know, and, and find a, a trusted partner. So there's kind of a couple of different nuances to this right here. Um, we work with many organizations, so there's kind of three primary ways that we see organizations start in analytics. Um, you know, either the executives find out about analytics and they're like, we want analytics and kind of try to drive that downwards. Um, you know, we've seen managers and directors get into analytics and then they got to sell analytics upwards and downwards to the people actually doing the work. And then we've seen like kind of a grassroots attempt to start uh, analytics. And this is where maybe the executives don't have buy-ins, but the workers understand the value of it. And so we see a lot of little analytics pods spring up in the organization. And that always isn't the best way to start because if you have different people doing analytics, doing different transformations to data and not talking to each other, then you can get a similar metric that's calculated a little bit differently or data that's transformed a little bit differently. And when you talk to each other, the results aren't the same. They don't make sense. And it causes a lot of confusion and delay and inability to make decisions. So another recommendation is to have a really solid change management plan. So this plan kind of spells out, you know, where you think the impediments might be, the people that you need to get on board, um, you know, the sideways influential leaders that can really help drive through a process of acceptance in the organization. Um, and the last recommendation would be to, you know, along with the executive buy-in, is to understand that it takes time to change a way a person does, a way a person makes decisions, um, a way a person is gonna access their data or access the information they use to make their decisions. And so if, if we look at how most people work um, in an environment right now, and their time is a full glass of water, right? If we're gonna add analytics on top of that into an organization that's not used to dealing with it yet, the executives are gonna to have to figure out what water can spill out of that glass. So the additional time that analytics is gonna add at first to get it implemented has space to go, right? Because you can't just add on more work to an already busy schedule. And it's up to the executives to show that it's okay to focus efforts on this analytics initiative and maybe let some of the other things go for a little while. 
I love the metaphor of the glass of water. <laughs> um, okay, so, you know, we like to end these um, with some best practices. So what would you advise to consumer goods companies who are really just, you know, looking to get started or, or, or improve their AI and ML and implement implementations, um, but they don't quite know where to start? Yeah, absolutely. So I think one of the most important things that an organization can do is to find a trusted partner. Now, whether that's elder research or another partner, um, you know, that's fine. But to find somebody to really help you make those hard decisions like when to buy a solution or when to build a solution. There's plenty of on the shelf solutions out there that are, you know, work perfectly well um, to do analytics on a specific problem. Um, other times people or other vendors try to sell analytic solutions that just aren't right for what the organization wants to you know, find out or the information they want to provide to make decisions out of. So it's good to have a trusted partner kind of go over those things with you. Someone with the knowledge of what it's going to take to build a solution. Um, and if your organization is culturally ready for it or has the technology ready for it. Um, and somebody who can help build out that roadmap. So if you do need to gather more resources to implement your own solutions or design your own solutions or build an analytics team that is done in the right way that can gain momentum um, with, you know, potential problems already marked out and solutions to those problems, you know, available in case they come up. Um, another thing that a trusted partner can do is help with kind of the validation um, statistical robustness of a model. Um, some of these off the shelf solutions, I, I checked out a software program the other day that had about 20 different models, um, you know, with a bunch of different parameters for each model. So if you throw data in an environment like that, um, there's potentially hundreds of different models that you're using to look at this data. Well, one of them is gonna come up with some really exciting results just on the basis that you're using so many different models. And so it's really important, especially if, if you have solutions like that, to statistically validate the results. Um, look at it, what those results might be um, compared to what would be what would happen with chance. And so a trusted partner helps put all these guidelines and frameworks in place so you aren't making too many mistakes with your analytics program. I don't think a lot of people realize that there is a big cost in bad analytics. Um, I think a lot of people understand what good potential can come from good analytics and good ROI, but I don't think that they understand um, how detrimental a bad model could be and how that can derail efforts for a very long time. Well, thank you. Uh, you're leaving us with some great food for thought. Um, so we are out of time. Jen, I want to thank you so much for joining to, to talk with me today. Uh, just a reminder to anyone who's watching, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to myself or to Elder Research. Uh, but for now, thank you for watching and thank you for joining. Thank you. Thank you.